We were pipsqueaks at the time. Even though we'd gone public, we were a tiny company. You know, there are a hundred big players that if they kind of thought about this the right way, just the power of, of staff and capital to step into that space if they saw what the end game was. This episode is sponsored by Skilljar.com, founded by ex-Amazonian Sandy Lynn and Jason Stewart. Skilljar is the leading customer education platform. Innovative companies such as Tableau, LinkedIn, and hundreds more rely on Skilljar to onboard, engage, and retain their customers at scale. To learn more, visit Skilljar.com, S-K-I-L-L-J-A-R.com. Hi. I'm Dave Chappelle, and I'd like to welcome you to the Invent Like an Owner podcast, where I talk with the Amazonians who helped build Amazon.com into one of the world's most valuable companies. This weekly podcast is for entrepreneurs, future business leaders, and all students of history, not to mention people interested in getting hired at Amazon. The goal of the podcast is to capture the Amazon creation stories and create a historical archive. On that note, my guests are recalling history as best they can. It's possible some of the details are fuzzy or just plain wrong that happens, it's not intentional. I invite future guests or commenters on the website to help us get the facts as straight as they can be. Now, on with the show. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking with Joel Spiegel, who I was surprised to discover only worked at Amazon for four years, from uh, 1997 to 2001. Because in my personal experience, Joel loomed very large. He made a huge impact on the organization. Uh, Joel exuded ownership and customer obsession and raised the bar for everyone. Uh, today, we'll be talking in depth about Joel's impact on the organization, especially connected to the transition from a retail-centric business model to a marketplace-driven business model. Welcome, Joel. Hi, Dave. Hey there. So, yeah, I was when I was going through your LinkedIn, it's crazy. You were at, again, I may get a little wrong, but VisiCalc or VisiCorp, the parent company, uh, HP, Apple, Microsoft, and then Amazon. It's quite a run. Yeah, it sort of surprises me. It was interesting. Who recruited you? Was it Jeff or is it, you know, a typical loop? Like, how did that all work? So it's a funny tie in to that list of companies you just made, because during my time in Silicon Valley, you know, there's a corp, Apple, et cetera, HP, <clears throat> ran across a uh, tech recruiter named Vicki Helms. And she was sort of legendary, one of the highest emotional intelligence people I know. She wasn't particularly a technologist, but she was incredibly networked. Like you didn't find her, she found you. Right. And later on in my time in the Valley, uh, she, uh, I got a call from another recruiter named Susan Shea. And anyway, got to know Susan. And fast forward a bunch of years, <clears throat> when I was at Microsoft, uh, actually running a group doing a sort of uh, doing some search technology at the time. Um, I got a call from Susan and she said, I have a perfect job for you. And my response was, I'm happy at Microsoft. And right. She, she said, um, <clears throat> this job has your name written all over it. It's in your backyard. Um, and if you don't go talk to these folks, I will declare you stupid and never talk to you again. Not a typical <laughs> comment right. from a recruiter. And <clears throat> it turned out it was Amazon and Jeff and Jeff and I went and had a breakfast and, uh, had a very interesting conversation. So it was sort of like, you know, the, the connection chased back years and companies, um, as to why I got the call, but you know, uh, it, it felt right. And Jeff, convinced me that it was the right place to be. And there we were. I mean, at that point, were there even interview loops or was it just you talking to Jeff, you know, and getting hired? No, it's, I mean, I spoke with some of the other uh, folks at the company as part of the process, but, um, but, you know, it was, it was a much smaller, less structured place to be sure. Um, you know, the first person I spoke with, interestingly, was, you know, we had breakfast on a Saturday morning. He took me to, over to the offices in the Columbia building, which I'm always uh, inclined to point out is quite different than the luxurious Columbia Tower. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, 15, 16, second half. Yes. And, uh, you know, the first person I met was Sean Haynes, who was running the, the associates program. And I, I had worked with Sean's spouse, uh, Mary, um, at Microsoft. She's in HR. And Sean was, all, was excited because, you know, to give a sense of scale, uh, the associates program had just hit 6,000 members. Right. Uh, you know, so it was quite, quite small uh, yeah. relative to what's going on today. And when you were brought in, were you brought in for a specific 
was there a specific problem? I mean, you, your title was VP engineering right out of the gate, or was it a different role when you joined? I, I think we settled on VP of engineering. Essentially, I think Jeff had, you know, he'd be the better one to answer this, but he had been looking for uh, somebody run technology and had come to the conclusion that there were two slices of technology that he couldn't find in a single person. So he needed somebody to handle sort of the transactional IT infrastructure, but also somebody who had sort of what I would call the Silicon Valley Apple user interface experience, right. you know, which I had obviously picked up at places like Apple and as a corp. I was brought in to address the the sort of scaling the user facing technology side right out of the gate. And I think uh, there were a dozen or so technology people in the company at the time. Uh, half of them were sort of on what, what you might call the, the user facing technology side of the house, although everybody was kind of a jack of all trades to some degree. Um, and then, you know, we very quickly jumped into what matters to customers, what could we do, what should we do, it got down to Besides scaling, which was a nightmare from day one, you know, we had issues of, uh, you know, inventing recommendations that were useful, search technology that was relevant and did a good job, et cetera, et cetera. The, the state of technology was essentially, you know, Shell, Kappen had built the whole thing from scratch with the help of one or two other people. There were a few others who had joined prior to my arrival, but it was really you know, for something that was was serving a very large user base and a company is about to go public, is a very, very tiny engineering organization or set of organizations. So scaling was a, a big deal. I ended up, um, you know, you may have heard me say it that, you know, really I was just an over-glorified recruiter because right. if you don't have the right teams, you don't, it just doesn't, you can't do anything, you know, <laughs> so you need, you need the people, the management and leadership structures that, that make it work. And that was really- Who were some of those key first? I mean, I talked to Kim Rockmiller a few days ago. She mentioned that you recruited her. Were there some of those other people that jump out at you as sort of the big contributors from early on that you brought in? You know, it's again, it all ties to sort of networks in a sense. So, you know, Dwayne Bowman, Gene Pope. Did you work with Gene at Apple? I actually was hired into Apple by Gene Pope. And, and he, I, I contacted Gene the first day of his retirement and said, yeah, forget that retirement thing. You got to come to Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, so it was his first day of his retirement from Apple. You recruited them right back into the, the madhouse. He, he had been out of Apple. He had run, I think, engineering for Quark and he retired. I, I went to call him at Quark and the, the folks at Quark said, oh, he doesn't work here anymore. And you know, I knew he obviously must have retired to the ranch in Montana and contacted him, said, you have to come. But the other thing that's funny, you know, you mentioned Kim. The reason I, we got Kim is uh, Kim had been working with Erica Locke at, uh, at a startup. And when I contacted Erica, who had worked for me at Apple, <laughs> you know, Kim became part of the conversation as well. And, and Ruben Ortega came in. Uh, to work with Dwayne because of his connections to Erica, et cetera. So a lot of so a lot of sort of very real life social networking uh, was a key part of very rapid hiring processes. What is it about when you spoke to Jeff that got you know got you excited to join Amazon? You know, you were at Microsoft; it's probably a good job. Like, was it was it Jeff? Was it his charisma? Was it the scope of the problem or the impact you thought it was going to have on you know? The world, like, what is it that made you make another big jump? That's a long conversation in its own right. But we had breakfast, and you know, the economics of selling on the internet made sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in a strange way, I had set up a personal little, you, you know, personal passion project. Yeah. And when I started getting into to managing technology teams, and I wanted to learn more about business. Through a strange set of circumstances, I ended up sent, selling kayak paddles on the internet, specifically because I wanted a very well-bounded little business. I had an opportunity. And uh, at the time, the internet was not the web. So it was wreck, wreck boats, whitewater was my vehicle for doing things. And it became clear to me sort of what the economics of, of selling that way were. So it was an incredibly right. fast converse, conversation with Jeff. The first thing I thought is, Wow, I'm really stupid. How did I not think of starting this company? <laughs> because I knew the, the core economics of doing those kinds of transactions via the internet. So we skipped what were apparently a lot of the business explanations that Jeff went through 
uh, with with folks he was talking with along the way, uh, right. trying to explain why this made sense at a core business level, and immediately jumped into sort of the, the interesting scaling problems, people problems in terms of hiring and recruiting and building teams, things that led to some of the leadership principles, et cetera. So, so you know, it was obviously Jeff. He was clearly super smart. He was clearly committed. Um, but the problem space was fascinating, and it was a greenfield opportunity, right? There right. weren't a lot of e-com. There were no major e-commerce companies out there, so it just sang as a problem space. Do you remember what you know? Some of you, you know, because like I so said, we're going to talk about marketplace quite a bit because that you made such a big impact there. But in your first month or months, do you remember some of the first projects that you were sort of tasked with helping to wrangle? And it, obviously hiring was probably a couple hours of every single day, um, you know, interviewing and re- re- recruiting all that. But do you remember any specific projects that were a big sort of indoctrination to Amazon? Recruiting was, as you know, a huge, huge part of it, probably more than hours, you know, measured in days of week, not hours of day. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it, a lot of that bore fruit. You know, we, we fortunately, after many cycles of, of conversations, et cetera, you know, we brought in Rick Dalzell, et cetera. But those were not fast or easy processes. Right. Uh, but early on, you know, we, there was, all, before my arrival, there was already some work on recommendations. Uh, we, we knew we had to take friction out of the buying pipeline. Um those, those were big things. Jeff early on had the notion of wanting to do A-B testing. To my knowledge, he's the first person who thought about doing that. And honestly, uh, the first version of it we built, I, I, I sort of misjudged some things. Uh, so we took another run at that. Um, and he was right about sort of the flexibility and decentralization of how to do that. But uh, the key thing was we wanted to keep things small and fast. Jeff, mm-hmm. Jeff made me sort of do a handshake contract with him that we would target projects could be done in three or four weeks. They didn't have to be done perfectly. They had right. to be the right projects and proof of concept. And the notion was if they bore fruit, we would uh, we would then, you know, uh, scale them, enhance them, et cetera. So, right. Um, it, it was it was pretty interesting. For example, on recommendations, uh, there was a project underway. Uh, we got it under control. Jeff marches in one day and says, hey, there's a simpler approach. Um, and I'm like, well, I don't want to disrupt the st- schedule. And he's like, well, I would really appreciate it if you would. And uh, I'd like you to do that. And it turned out the, the simpler version was highly, highly effective. And the thing that I would have bet on was not. And so by keeping these things to relatively short development cycles, we were able to do experiments very quickly. Would you say when you got there, uh, Kim described the code base was sort of a monolith, right? It was one big uh, code base. Then, you know, and over time, you it got separated more into, you know, unique. I don't know what the correct terminology is, but what were things, would you say, was it more like a minimum viable product at that time in sort of today's language? Or was it pretty complex even at the stage when you joined? Structurally, I'm not sure I use the term minimal viable product, but I mean, again, when you're talking about a system where, and I don't think Shell gets enough credit in the, the public mind for, you know, building the store. Right. right? And, and when the company was tiny, there wasn't the kind of budget that I had where I would, you know, or that Dalzell had. And when we go out and talk to a vendor, we had a budget, we had leverage, you know, there were a lot of dimensions to it. When Shell needed a search engine, he wrote it. Right. And it was very clever and it scaled up to a point and then it didn't. And so, you know, it was very it was a very monolithic system by today's standards. But that's how you get things up. Right. right. It is classic for for software projects to be years and, mul- you know, years off, off schedule and multiples of budget. And so there's something to be said for get it done and make it work. And we yep. solved a lot of scaling problems. You know, my first winter there. Um, I just signed POs for more, more bigger hardware, <laughs> you know, because uh, we were trying to do, you know, we, we scaled some things. There was work on splitting the database off, but it was an incredibly monolithic product. And there were so many things that we did then um, over several years that today you just wouldn't do that way because we have, you know, things like AWS, we have yeah. infrastructure, we have knowledge and, you know, code libraries that just 
didn't exist 25 right. years ago. Yeah, it's definitely not a criticism. It's more of a fact. Like that if if somebody who's 25 right now thinks about what Amazon was like, you know, as a, a, a product or a program, you know, back then it was quite different because that was the way things were built then. And it was also getting it out in a hurry and testing and breaking things and, and all those things. And so, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a criticism. It's reality. You have to right size things and there's no point in, you know, using a data center's worth of servers for, for a technology, you know, for, for a feature or a technology and approach, you don't know if it'll work or not. And so it was a very long arc of balancing can you scale by writing a check for raw hardware? And today you would just do it by increasing your AWS account right. uh, limits, you know, and structures in terms of, of your use of AWS. So, um, yeah, it was a fascinating set of business problems. Uh, every month, do we apply software engineers to scaling? Do we apply them to new features, to bug fixes? Um, and, and it was just a, a constant, constant loop in that regard. Right. And so... Today, I wanted to talk a lot about the transition from Amazon, from retail only business where, you know, they're selling it and or we or they were selling it, pack, you know, purchasing it, put it in a warehouse, fulfilling it to a third party seller marketplace business. Can you explain, maybe put it into context for people like how it, how that came to be? Like, or was it a Jeff idea? Was it a you idea? Like where, where did it come from this idea of, Hey, we don't need to be the seller all the time. If you haven't talked to Jeff Blackburn, I, I'm sure you will. Yeah. And see what his his recollection is. But um, you know, one October, he was uh, he, he approached me, and we were just every year, you know, the the Chris, early on the Christmas scaling nightmare began in October and ran, uh, you know, right up through Christmas. Right. And uh, Jeff Blackburn, who was doing business development. Uh, wandered in last week of October, I believe it was, and uh, said he wanted me to help with some due diligence with an auction company he was thinking of purchasing for Amazon. And I kind of pushed back and said, look, we're a retailer. We have incredible scaling problems. I don't have any time to spare. He was like, I really need to do this due diligence. So I committed, I think, I think that was on a Wednesday. I forget whether that company was coming to do a presentation Thursday or Friday. Um, you know, I spent, spent half the day with the company, was not impressed with their technology or their approach, but, uh, talked to Blackburn a bunch more. And then, uh, over the weekend, he had gotten me thinking because as part of this evaluation, I'd taken a harder look at eBay than I had. And it triggered some thinking about the, you know, when I had been at Apple, we were focused on our products and, right. and control of those products. And when I went to Microsoft, there was a lot of philosophical thinking about platform. Right, the, the dynamic of markets building up the value of your products, and you know today uh, the world has changed a lot. People forget that in that time frame, Apple was on the verge of going bankrupt. Right. My wife is a landscape architect, as you know, and I remember telling her coworkers how dead Apple was, you know, <laughs> and that they were, you know, it's going out of business, and it's, you know, yes. and now now thirty thousand dollars of hardware later, <laughs> I'm firmly <Yes. laughs> uh, I'm firmly wrong, you know. Right, exactly. So, so you know, but that that the things that, that Jeff Blackburn made me look at got my brain going over the weekend. I spent the whole weekend hunkered down over eBay and thinking about platforms versus product and. And uh, maybe to sort of zip backwards in a sense, <clears throat> you know, anyone who was around Amazon at that point in time was familiar with the terms selection price convenience, right? That was a customer proposition. We took it seriously. Um, you know, it wasn't sort of just like random branding. We really internalized that. How do we make sure we are delivering selection price convenience? And over the weekend, I became convinced that we alone as a retailer could never lead the way with selection price convenience if right. we were the only seller of goods on our systems. And so, you know, as a, as a simple example, we were selling books, but there's always somebody who's going to get remainders or a bankruptcy closeout from somewhere that could sell book a book title we had for less. Yeah. Or there would be... A collectible. A collectible. There would be other things that uh, just we couldn't get that somebody would choose not to sell on Amazon. Yeah. I always said, it's like, if I'm going to want to read some beach books, 
They don't need to be hard covers. <laughs> they can be pa paperbacks with the, the front cover ripped off because I'm just going to read it. My hands are wet. They're going to be sand in it. Like, you know, it's sort of different. You, you want different types of products or different qualities of products at different times. Exactly. And then there would be things where we just couldn't buy them for some reason. Somebody had a self-published book and they wanted to be involved in the transaction. And so, and then of course the convenience proposition fails if people have to look at 10 sites for what they want. And yep. so, you know, it, it just got the, my, my gear spinning in the following Monday morning. It was, I think the first Monday that November, um, I grabbed Blackburn and said, we just have to talk to Jeff. This is, you, you have raised, you know, you've got my brain going and I think it changes the whole value proposition for the company. So Jeff Blackburn and I went into Jeff Bezos' office a little bit before nine, if I remember right. Because I remember very vividly uh, looking at the clock when we wrapped up and it was 920. Right. Right. So this all happened in about half an hour. And, and we, the three of us had a conversation about um, what it would be to be a retail platform, a selling platform, rather than to always be the one taking the risk of buying the merchandise, trying to price it competitively. Um, you know, and fighting the whole world as opposed to engaging the whole world right. and all of the points of failure that that would engender if we were fighting against everyone else all the time. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was, it was very interesting. You know, uh, Jeff Bezos had a, you know, two Jeffs in the room, so to be clear, you know, had a little whiteboard in his office and we scribbled on the whiteboard and we talked and, and if I remember correctly, media metrics, the internet, uh, marketing analysis stuff still came out in binders and, yeah. you know, Jeff Bezos pulls out the media metrics binders and looks at a bunch of stickiness and revisitation things with respect to eBay. And, uh, and by nine twenty or so, he pretty much said, you're right. We have to do, you guys are right. We have to do this, uh, because it's, it's just a compelling proposition. We cannot fulfill the brand promise without making this happen somehow. And, right. you know, at that time, we already discussed, you know, pricing mechanisms, et cetera. So there were a lot of reasons why we talked about auctions and Z shops and whatnot. But early on, literally from the beginning, the notion was to be a selling platform Yeah. and to have different pricing and, and shipping mechanisms, et cetera. You know, it, it was a very long conversation possible about this. But before 930, uh, Jeff Bezos said, make it happen, be responsible with the shareholders, resources, and assets, you know, don't break things too badly, which proved to be a very challenging uh, thing to try to do. As you know, we yeah. both lived through those challenges and he alluded, you know, Jeff Bezos alluded to that, those things, I think in the 2016 shareholder letter, you know, and he told me, he said, pull together a senior management meeting for Saturday. We have to start socializing this and getting the company used to the idea that we're going to do this. Did your role change with uh, sort of driving on marketplace or was it just one more thing on your plate at the time? So at the time I did this, I was the general manager of the store. I was reporting to David Risher at the time, um, who uh, I just love to death. And I want to give a pitch for his uh, nonprofit organization, World Reader. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's doing wonderful global work uh, with that. But, um, but no, I was, I was general manager of the store. And I originally thought we would hire someone to run our, our platform efforts. And it just turned out to be a really challenging recruiting problem. And I was convinced it was super important. So uh, I ended up shifting into that role and focused 100% on Marketplace for a couple of years. What made, I mean, there were a hundred things that made Marketplace difficult. Like maybe talk about how, we, why did we decide to start with auctions rather than, you know, and maybe that's all we had because we saw eBay and we said, we got to do that. <laughs> and would probably a big mistake maybe, but, but we'll talk about, you know, how we made the decision or how you and people at the top made the decision to do auctions first and, you know, and, and how quickly it spun up. Cause I remember it, it spun up fast. I remember getting pulled in as a product manager and, you know, I'm like, I didn't, even, I didn't even know what auctions were at the time. You know, I think why auctions had to do with two things. It was a desire to step into and learn about variable pricing and, because there, there was an inevitable collision with eBay and, you know, being, being, you know, addressing that sort of uh, competitive situation head on uh, was, was I think part of it too. But again, I don't recall those discussions exactly, but we very quickly decided variable, you know, to go for variable pricing, which in the form of auctions. 
And as you know, we had a lot of discussions about how to structure that and, and even the, the pricing models of auctions themselves. But right. immediately, you know, we set about looking at a fixed price model, which led us to purchase exchange, you know, Steve Leshley's company, exchange.com. Uh, we bought live bid, which was Matt Williams and Sky Cruises company. Um, so, you know, we, we approached this both by developing inside and doing a combination of, of talent acquisition and sort of tech and intellectual property through, through buying these various companies. Like people didn't know yeah. for a, a <laughs> long time, Amazon had two or maybe even three different buying pipelines. I don't know if you remember when people would put something in their shopping cart and one item was a, a, a marketplace item and one, one item was a retail item. They were essentially checking out on two different payment platforms, if I'm correct. Yes. We, we, I mean, I don't, I don't even remember the mechanics and they changed over time, but we, you know, we initially started with our marketplace mechanisms uh, uh, as a separately built platform from the, the mainline retail stuff. And, right. and that was a function of, of really just pragmatics. I think, you know, and you couldn't break the retail stuff. And also we didn't understand, right. One of the things that happened that Monday morning was uh, um a discussion about learning. It's one thing to go out and try to compete with a company based on you have a slightly more efficient technology or you know you think you can do it better or you can address a slightly different market. There were there was no best practices for being a global uh, online retail marketplace. Right. Right. There just there was no no guidebook. And we actually discussed the fact that we would have to uh have a lot of fortitude and conviction in order to to make it happen. And we took a guess, and it turned out to be about right, that it might take three runs at the problem. But we had conviction because, again, when you went back to that selection price convenience uh, analysis, it, it, it just had to happen. Right. right. There was just no avoiding it. And so we had to find a way to make it work. And the discussion was very clear on the fact that we would have to accept pain and failure in a sense right. along the way. I, c I could have done with a little less failure over those couple of years. They, they were, they were <laughs> psychologically difficult years until we figured it out. They were for all of us. Yeah. You know, they, took a, they took a toll. You know, I think it was in the 2016, again, uh, shareholder letter, Jeff talked about sort of fundamental misalignments and mm -hmm. marketplace did not align readily with retail. The real, you know, as you know, probably better than any human on earth, the, the, the review and reward structures for product managers who owned product items. And they're, you know, they had to worry about, you know, stuff they bought, selling that inventory, how fast they sold it, their margins, et cetera. As you know, we generated no great love with those guys. Yeah. Um, when we allowed other people to sell on our site and even put links from their product pages into third party seller pages that would undercut them and make it harder for them to sell their product at the price they would have liked to have sold it, et cetera. So it was hard. I look forward to talking to the people that sort of uh, launched customer reviews, for instance. That was another example that was not popular at the time with the powers that be, you know, and just we believed it was the right thing to do. I, it happened before I got there, maybe even, maybe even before you got there, but we believed it was the right thing to do for customers. And so we needed to figure out, you know, how to make it work for, for the, the, let's say authors, for instance, in that case, or, or the manufacturers of a product that was getting one star reviews. We said, well, long term, this is going to be a good thing because <laughs> we're going to help people buy the best product and return <laughs> the items less often, you know, and, 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 but in the short term, there's a, there are some eggs getting broken. Yeah. I mean, another example of exactly that was uh, when we introduced the bestseller list. Yeah. Because, the New York Times bestseller list, I'm, I'm, you know, again, a lot of years out, but <clears throat> it was based on sell in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something could become a bestseller just because Barnes and Noble bought a ton of copies, not because the public was consuming it. Right. And we were doing ours based on sell through. What was the public actually buying? And, <clears throat> you know, two things happened first. Um, a lot of authors and publishers got upset because it was sort of a paradigm shift for that. And, right. you know, I forget which one, one of the major CEOs of one of the major publishing houses in New York apparently saw what was going on and threw his phone across the room back when phones were wired <laughs> to <Yeah>. their desks. <laughs> and a lot of authors went through a transition, you know, from like getting upset at that because they reached the New York times list to actually realizing, Oh, this is actually really reflects important stuff. And I can, yeah. 
I can monitor this and behave around this. And then we also sort of as a, uh, along the lines of the way marketplace sort of had to deal with uh, seller and buyer behavior, you know, we already, we had basically, you know, people starting to game it. There were some folks in Wisconsin that had a self-published book that they had friends order 10,000 copies of yep. were overnight, the best sellers. On <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's also those great stories about authors sitting there and refreshing the page, you know, waiting to see if their, you know, their books moving up and I forget if that was done hourly or we did it daily. I, I can't remember the, you know, how that worked at the time. Um, so when you, with, 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 marketplace and maybe not just specific to auctions because maybe if you can give a short description of auction the difference between auctions and z shops and marketplace for people that don't e maybe don't even know what we're talking about like with the, the shortest example of marketplace is if you, a customer goes to the website and you go to a new harry potter i'm dating myself there there will be used copies for sale and those used copies are sold from anything like big bookstores to you know which handle used books to you and I listing the product on the site. But can you give a short summary of the evolution from where we started with, with auctions and how we got to, to marketplace and why it was such a big deal? We started with the notion we had to be a selling platform and a buying platform. And for a lot of reasons, we probably in hindsight, you know, it's hard after all these years to think about where we just didn't understand and where we were limited by technology and staff and the ability to move quickly. Because if we were going to touch, you know, Obidos, which was a core, you know, selling platform for Amazon as a retailer, you, you sort of got tangled up in timing and that particular database structure and, and whatnot. So somewhere along the way, we decided to sort of partition it. So we would do auctions, which was variable pricing. We would do Z shops, which was fixed pricing. We, we did an auctions partnership with Sotheby's as well, which was its own beast. And, um, and it was, I mean, it was interesting because it was all geared towards becoming a selling platform and figuring out how to meet the needs of buyers and sellers um, <clears throat> effectively. And, and it was, it was interesting. We never thought of it as, oh, there's an auctions thing that's going to stand alone forever. And there's a fixed price thing that's going to stand alone forever. It was all part of this, in a sense, journey. Right. And we referred to it as marketplace internally very early on. And, yeah. and we, we very much didn't refer to it as marketplace externally because we were pipsqueaks at the time, right? You, you remember, but I mean, you know, even though we'd gone public, we were a tiny company and, and, you know, there are a hundred big players that if they kind of thought about this the right way, you know, really had a lot. I mean, just just the power of, of, of staff and capital to, to step into that space if they saw what what the end game was. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> you know, we we did we very deliberately did not talk use the word marketplace externally for a very long time. And we didn't know what the end game was. So, you know, we talked, if you remember, we hypothesized about single detail page and unification of, of inventories. But, you know, that came after I was already gone. It was a big deal. I mean, like, what, but in hindsight, it's very easy to say what we shouldn't have tried. <laughs> but at the time, you know, we were figuring out as we go. But one thing that was always a mess was, and we knew it kind of from day zero, was the 575 different detail pages for Moby Dick, you know, like the used version. And we'd have 500 different uh, listings. And we're like, this doesn't make no sense. Like they're all the same thing. And, it, you know, I would say that half.com, like we definitely had the idea before we saw half.com, but half.com was an epiphany in like, you know, because literally we had all of that described, you know, we're going to fix price shipping for sellers. We're going to put these listings right on the pages. And, and that was the big change was like going from the 500 or 5,000 copies of Moby Dick on the auctions of the Z shop site, all eight, mm -hmm. eight cents off from each other to putting yeah. 457 copies available, starting at 35 cents, uh, right on the detail page. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's sort of close to what we see now, but but back then that was the biggest part of the change, I think. People take things for granted, right? Even even with Amazon as just its own seller of merchandise, there was a lot of work done on on you know uh, book you know title authority for books and a different even just different editions. If you're reading <clears throat> 
Lord of the Rings and you finish the second book and you want the third, you'd probably want the third in the same, you know, paperback edition, the same hardback edition, the same, um, you know, anniversary edition. You don't want this motley collection of things. It turned out that, that, that figuring those things out was hard when you actually had ISBNs and, and right. industry information. Now you have people listing things, some of which are Moby Dick, the commodity thing versus, like you said, a collectible. Yeah. Moby Dick, the first edition or the, you know, Herman Melville signed Moby Dick is a very different proposition than just listing it as the, you know, oh yeah, it's a, along with the paperbacks kind of a thing. So these are strangely hard problems. Did we refer to that as item authority even back then? Do you remember? That is my recollection. I think uh, if I recall, I could be wrong, but you know, the catalog folks, you know, and uh, on the tech side, Rebecca Allen, I think maybe Scott Northrup may have uh, worked on that. And, and Rebecca was very deep into that. She actually yeah. solved a very tough nut by inventing the ASIN, which was compatible with ISBNs. So it, it, it saved us, you know, it, it cracked a very tough problem for how do you migrate from selling things ID'd by ISBN to how do you sell kind of anything. And for the listener, if you go to any product on Amazon and you look at the URL, I don't even know if ASIN, I don't know if that's in the URL anymore. I think it's DP for detail page, but ASIN is an Amazon standard identification number, I think. And so we basically had ASIN, unique ASINs for every product in the catalog. But to Joel's point, you can have 15 different Moby Dick ASINs that are you know, it's the out of copy or out of trademark version. It's the leatherback version. It's the paperback version. They're all the same words or mostly all the same words in the product. And so item authority is a really difficult problem. And especially later on when you th get things like uh, clothing, where you not only have unique items, but then you have attributes like color and size and sex and, uh, and, and, and. So that's a, that's a different interview at some point, you know, when you think about how difficult it, it is to go, you know, from books to music, was probably pretty simple versus going from books, music, and video to electronics, which was a totally different product. But getting off topic. Um, so, <laughs> so, so with, with, when you look back at Marketplace, and I've never asked you this, like we should have just not done auctions, right? I mean, it's nice to say we learned something, <laughs> um, but like in hindsight, if we hadn't done auctions and, and we had done fixed price or something closer to single detail page out of the gate, like it was a, it was a long, painful learning curve, wasn't it? Um, you know what I mean? Cause so anyway, I want I always wanted to ask you that. I I've felt that way. I'm like, it was way too much time focusing on eBay and maybe it's cause we do nothing about being a marketplace, but have you thought about that? To a certain extent, and this gets down even to the business environment and money, you know, one of the things you have to deal with is when you step into a new space, you, you're going to, you're going to miscalculate certain things. So, for example, just to get to the nuts and bolts, <clears throat> I got budget based on what I estimated it would take to convince our retail customers to try out the marketplace side, Z-Shops auctions. Um, I grossly misestimated that. It was doable, but we, they were largely different buying bases. There were people who really, really trusted Amazon but were hesitant about third parties. And if you, you, know, you were involved in the A to Z guarantee and all of those things, to sort of put Amazon's brand trust behind the buying from third parties. But, you know, we got to a point where we actually had a pretty good understanding of what these, the, what the platform characteristics were for auctions, for fixed price, et cetera, what it took to get a customer. And that was right during sort of the, the time when uh, we got a lot of pressure from Wall Street and we were cutting, you know, and people right. again, they forget it was not always a smooth, clear road. And we were in the process of doing layoffs and freezing budgets and, and so on. And so this was, this was a challenging moment. And, you know, I, I had some, some heated uh, discussions with our CFO, Warren Jensen, because I had figured what I, what I thought we, we would take to make auctions successful and I wasn't getting that money. So, right. you know, you could argue there's all these points with, we, we, Focus on fixed price might have been smarter. Spending more on auctions, despite the pressure, <clears throat> financial pressures we were under, might have been smarter. Uh, because again, I, I felt at that point I knew what the economic dynamics were. But it's a real world, right? There are trade-offs. Yeah. There are hard things. 
So I have pondered, you know, a lot of people think auctions was a mistake. I, I go back and forth as to whether it was a necessary stepping stone or not. And I might not be the right person to to answer that because I, you know, spilled the, a lot of my own <laughs> blood, sweat and tears on that. You know, the funny thing is in the long range, the, the one that still should exist is Sotheby's. Like that was a really nice site. And if that were still on the Amazon site today, it's probably where I would spend most of my time just out of interest, you know, like what, you know, with NFTs and all these things going on now. But um, yeah, we, again, live and, live and learn along the way. And the Sotheby's thing was, I mean, there were a lot of things that made, that, that, that made that more complicated and problematic. And yes, I wish that had been done. And Jeff and I had a few ideas that, that, honestly, yeah, it would have been interesting to do and might still be interesting to do someday. So I won't enumerate them, right. but there's some very interesting things you could do globally. But, but, you know, the crux of it was you can't offer the greatest sort of, you can't be the, the, the best at offering selection price convenience without being a selling platform is what it reduced to. One big shift is we had to build tools for sellers. So we had our own tools for things like, you know, buying and uh, interfacing with suppliers. But can you talk a little bit about the that change, you know, where we had to build basically seller central, I think it was what was called out of the gate and, you know, how that forced how that forced the organization to sort of change its way of thinking that we had a we now had a different customer that we had to to serve. There was no obvious obvious easy sort of knowledge base within the company. I'm sure there were people out in the world who who would have immediately said, oh, you need this. And our sellers told us very quickly we needed to, you know, uh, tap and give them a way to connect to their inventory, to tie into their bookkeeping requirements, their compliance and tax requirements with their products, et cetera. So yeah, there was a whole new space that we had to start from ground zero. It, it sounds strange, but was that something that was almost like we knew what we had to build on the front end and then like eight hours later, we're like, oh, geez, we need to build all this stuff on the back end as well. Like, because uh, I kind of remember it like that. I'm like, oh, I'm not just the product manager on auctions for the front side of it. I have, <laughs> we have to start thinking about all the tools, oh. you know, and and the sellers were almost as bad as consumers in, the, in their their requests, you know what I mean? They're never ending. And like, no matter what we built yes. or how fast we built it, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. So, yeah, I mean, that's the sort of interesting thing. We bootstrapped ourselves and my recollection, and again, there are probably other people who remember it in more detail is exactly what you said, uh, because we are not, we didn't have experience with sellers on the platform. We really had not internalized their needs and their wants until they kind of let us know in no uncertain terms what those were. So, yes, it's sort of like, you know, we bootstrapped ourselves in the way that um, Amazon's, you know, sort of inventory management systems early on when I joined were incredibly, uh, by today's standards, primitive, but they made sense for the scale Amazon was at. So when I interviewed and the first time I went down to the, this was called the warehouse at Dawson, um, when you placed an order, you got a space allocated on a shelf. And as the parts for your order came in, they got put in your space. And when the system knew that all the parts of your order were, were finished, somebody went and grabbed that and, and shipped it to you. And, I, you know, we went, you know, very at, at the time I joined, they were just finishing up uh, what was called, a, you know, random binning and picking. And, yeah. you know, anyone who had done large warehouses earlier would probably have just said, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. So there were a lot of places where we hired in knowledgeable talent, but, but other places where we just were like, oh, we need to learn this and understand yeah. and listen to our customers. It's funny. I, I loved working in the warehouse, but, you know, I, it's probably just different mentalities, but it was just awesome seeing that sort of last touch before the customer got it and the sort of magic on, again, that was just constantly evolving the software to make picking more productive, you know, speed up throughput. It's basically a big ops problem. And, um, I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was fascinating. The one thing that was really cool, even though it was not scalable about the original system is you could walk, through, you know, again, it was a little company. You could kind of go anywhere. You could walk through the stacks of shelving and see orders coming together and, yeah. and visually see personalities and, 
and professional interests and people's professional development just by the stacks of books in their or in an order. I didn't, yeah. you know, it was just a number on a shelf. You didn't know who it was or where they were, but you, it was just fascinating to see what went together. I do remember that too. I remember, you know, cause I was out of, I didn't graduate from my MBA, but I just like, I remember thinking about how quickly you learn who the person is by the types and books were perfect, right? Cause it's expressions of interest and you could just see how the computers were going to be able to make better recommendations over time and, you know, make smarter decisions about new categories, like which new category would be interesting to this pot of people versus that pot of people. Um, it was really, uh, exciting. So do you remember, were you still there? Were you, so you left in 2001, were you yeah. there through the launch of Marketplace, the successful, you know, single detail page, or did you leave before we got to that? So to the best of my recollection, you know, I, I left Marketplace in the hands of Eric Ringwald, and uh, then uh, Mike George took over. And so yeah. it, was, it was a couple, gen you know, there were generations of this, of, of learning, of, of normalizing this throughout the company because as you know there was a tremendous uh, <clears throat> immune system reaction to this part of the company causing you know the marketplace part of the company and and again i refer to the entire arc of this as marketplace yeah um you know uh competing and causing pain for the retail side the retail side of the business did not care for the marketplace side of the business we had a lot of resources we were generating little revenue you know, it was, and then when we launched single detail page, Joel, it was, and it was the example of, you know, a three year overnight success or, or however many years yes. it took. Like I remember that, that first day, it was a significant percentage of units sold. And suddenly all these people like marketplace <laughs> that didn't, you know, for many years. And, but if I were, if I weren't working on marketplace, I wouldn't have cared for us much either. <laughs> you know, when I'm start, when I'm starved for resources and I'm generating all the revenue, you know? And we had these discussions at one point, you know, our revenue was so low when I, I offered from a accounting point of view to the product managers, I said like, here's the deal. <clears throat> I've got a, a nascent business, but how about I just credit your side with all of our sales? Yeah. Right. And that didn't sing well and our sales were, were quite small. So it's like, you know, all you're doing is inflicting pain without returning enough to make that worthwhile. Um, and our customer, as I said, I had originally misestimated our customer acquisition costs into marketplace. But interestingly, they were quite a bit less than the customer acquisition costs were when I joined Amazon. But yeah. people forget, you know, a couple of years, you fast forward a couple of years and people are used to, oh, we have this business, people are buying, here's our cost structure. And, and there was actually a point where, where a CFO, uh, Warren, wandered down and told me he wanted me to shut down Marketplace. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with that word, because that was internally I was referred to at the time. You said your, your, your spend is too high and your return to the business is too small. And, um, you know, again, it took a lot of corporate conviction and discussion and debate to stick with this based on, on the premise that ultimately – it, it, we, we ha you know, the issue wasn't, would it work? The issue was, how did we figure out how to make it work? Yeah. And again, you, you, you were a key player in that, right? I yeah. mean, it was a long process of iterations and understanding uh, how do you price for buyers? How do you price for sellers? Uh, how do you make it work? How do you even get adequate product in each category to retain buyers and sellers? Yeah. It was a big chicken in the egg. Like, do we focus on the seller? Do we focus on the buyer? Like ultimately I think the answer is you get sales for the sellers. They stick around no matter the pain, <laughs> you know, they give you, they give you a window to improve the tools and make things better, but, uh, which is what happened with the third iteration. The first two, they weren't getting enough sales because we were, you know, just didn't, we, we didn't have it cobbled together well enough for buyers to find their products. And, um, but once we did, uh, you know, we, 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 once the sales were flowing, we had the oxygen, if you will, to, and the time to just constantly improve things for sellers and, and uh, the flywheel got, got turning. As you know, we had a, a, a nightmare of trying to get sellers and get buyers early on, especially sort of in the Z shops days. And we would, we had a very active and great group of people recruiting sellers and sellers would come and I forget what the half-life was, but it was measured in, in a small number of months. They would leave because they wouldn't 
have enough buyers. And at one point, you know, Jeff had wanted to do a project where we would basically buy one of everything on the planet to list in the catalog and and everybody in the company pretty much hated it including me and we were talking about this chicken and egg problem and he said well the answer is back to my pet project in effect and right. uh, and i was like i got annoyed because i said look why do you want to compete with marketplace we need to achieve this via marketplace and he said i'm actually trying to help marketplace and it was right. uh, it was a simple but brilliant insight into the chicken and egg problem he said it's really hard to get people to have faith and conviction <clears throat> But it's easy to, if you have faith and conviction, to put your resources and your energy behind it. And so, uh, you know, early on in the conversation, he started saying, going back to this pet project of his that everybody pretty much didn't like, including myself. And I just said, like, step back, explain why you're pitching this. Right. You know, why, why are we having this conversation? And he said, because you have this chicken and egg problem. And if you just bring in sellers of, of, on, you know, of whatever category, and there's not buyers, they'll go away. If you bring in buyers and they can't find it, we fail the convenience part and they go away. And so he brought up, if I recall, it was, an, it was just an amazing conversation. So we, we, we can crack the chicken and egg problem by stocking stuff from all the categories that we're going to recruit sellers for. So right. I, you think, I think he said, uh, he talked about fishing rods and horseback riding saddles. Yeah. And said, you know, if somebody's a custom fly rod manufacturer, they try to sell on Amazon today, there's no buyers, they're going to get frustrated. So yeah. if we can develop an inventory of fishing rods, so people want to buy fishing rods come, they'll be here. And if they see a great custom fly rod, maybe they'll buy that. And now, yeah. you know, our, our, our sellers have a marketplace. And that really, I think was, you know, it took a long time to perform. Then there was the tech side and, and going to a unified detail page downstream after a few years but but that was a really important realization that we we had to use the things we could control to crack that chicken and egg problem when you step back and squint and get away from the details about auction z shot <laughs> like what broad lessons do you think future entrepreneurs can learn from that the big amazon retail to marketplace transition because it was a big big scary bet you know at a time when we were not financially secure you know, so if, again, stepping back from all the details, like, what do you think the sort of lesson is here for, you know, future business, future entrepreneurs? You know, it's easy to have conviction because you want to believe. Yeah. And people drive themselves off cliffs all the time because of that. I think it's important to, when you figure out something matters, it's an imperative, you have to have conviction and you have to make it happen and you have to find a way to get the resources to make it happen. and. And that's not always easy. I think, you know, being adequately capitalized, if you're going to talk to entrepreneurs, undercapitalization is like a death knell because you can't go out and, and, and have repeat failures. And we, we tried to fail smart, but whether it was on building distribution centers, you know, it was warehouses and distribution centers, and that's known, known as fulfillment centers, um, we, we acquired enough capital we could move fast and learn. And, mm -hmm. and, same thing here. We, even though we went through a bumpy time in terms of, you know, that 2001 dot com bust thing and that made life hard, um, we, we had capitalized ourselves very well. Um, and, and that gives, it gives us some navigating space. And then again, just you, you have to listen to the, to the universe, right? We didn't stick with auctions as they were. We didn't stick with Z shops. We, we acknowledged internally where we were getting it right and wrong. Um, you know, Jeff engaged and, and other senior folks engaged in really important conversations about uh, what are you guys getting right, what are you getting wrong, and why. And again, his his thinking about uh, inventory and and using our resources to to create a seller pool. You know, you just have to think of these as multi-dimensional problems. I don't think there's an easy, simple nut <laughs> to, to 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 hand out. I guess I'll end with uh, who, who, do, who should I interview next or who are some people that you think uh, have interesting stories to tell? Uh, I know you've shared some before, but um, anybody, as you're thinking about this, comes to mind as having made a gigantic impact and uh, their story should be heard? Let's see. Gosh. I mean, we've talked about, you know, you've got uh, Colleen Byram, Jane Radke Slade, Wendy Wolf. I mean, JJ, absolutely, you know. What, did, what, was, J, what was JJ's biggest Everybody has their claims to fame. What, uh, what, 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 what did she work on early on? 
So JJ led our, our initial uh, uh, efforts with respect to recommendations. So her team included, you know, Greg Linden and Eric, we ended up with Eric Benson on that team. Um, uh, you know, I mean, she's, she was also just uh, really helped uh, with sort of what I would call engineering social cohesion. You know, we had a number of people who were very good at that. So, you know, she, she was very good at, at, pulling people together to work on the right things at the right time, which yeah. mattered. So yeah, she was great. She, you know, so, and again, um, the work we did on recommendations, um, um, there, there were no good templates. There were no touchstones, no examples to follow. And so she, she pulled a lot of that work together. Artificial intelligence wasn't the hot term at the time. It was, uh, you know, and I, lo I look forward to talking to Dwayne and Ruben about the, you know, early Bottega boxes and, um, Oh my God, that was, and again, that was, you know, part of flexibility. Dwayne, you know, I had just resolved a bunch of scheduling issues with Jeff. The next morning, Dwayne and Ruben showed up and said, Oh, we have an idea. We'd like to blow all of our schedules up. Right. <laughs> so, and we did, right. I mean, I, I, they made the case. I took the case to Jeff and there we were. Awesome. Um, but yeah, compared to machine learning today, this is also so much of this is very, very primitive, but again, it was, you know, it's, it's a step at a time. These were the original building blocks for doing this kind of work. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about JJ is like, was with a lot of the other folks we had, she was jack of all trades, right? She knew Unix system administration. When we realized we needed seven by 24 coverage on a bunch of things, she camped in the office for a long time and worked on, you know, she would like do double duty doing systems work and software engineering work and management work, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, there's just, um, yeah, an astonishing set of people. I, I, I just, I don't even know how we, we ended up with such an amazing group of people because that was really yep. critical to surviving and to, to making things work. Yeah, I agree. Um, and the final thing to put this into context for people, marketplace, uh, at least what I, I was Googling earlier today, it's more than 50% of units sold. I don't know if dollars, or, it's hard to always compare some of these things, but more than 50% of units sold on Amazon, and I think this was a few years ago they passed the 50% threshold, are uh, marketplace driven. You know, So they're basically third parties, probably a lot larger ones than the ones we started with working with in the early auctions days. But you know, it includes small sellers because I still sell things from time to time on the site. So it's, it's a gigantic part of Amazon. If you haven't ever noticed it before, go take a look at the, the pages. You can list as a seller. Um, and maybe changes the way you think about the platform from a uh, from Amazon as a pure place you buy stuff to a place where you know hundreds of thousands of people make you know their business uh, selling on Amazon and eBay and other platforms uh, on the web. Um, so Joel, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I think we could probably do a few more hours on different topics, so I may <laughs> reach out. Um, I personally found it really interesting, and I'm positive other people will too. And as usual, it's great to catch up. I've told Joel this directly, but Joel made a huge impact on my life, like by giving me way too much responsibility <laughs> um, to, uh, to either screw up or succeed with. And so, um, and he also invested in my company after leaving Amazon. So huge uh, debt of thanks to you, Joel and, and Karen. Um, for the audience, thank you for listening to the podcast. If you'd like more details about what we discussed today, or want to contact me with edits or suggest things we got wrong, which is totally possible, please visit inventlikeanowner.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast to get all the future episodes. Uh, that's it for today. And remember, no sniveling. <laughs> <laughs>